Well, good morning, everybody. I'm so glad you're with me, and we're going to get right back into the book of Mark. So if you have your Bibles or your app, I want to encourage you to open that up to the book of Mark, chapter 10. And just a reminder, we're really walking through uh, the book of Mark, looking at who Jesus is. That's the key that we want to understand, why he came, the purpose of the gospel, and why he came for us. Um, what's our response to the kingdom of God being near, as Jesus said? And ultimately, we're seeing how Jesus continues to push into the religious and cultural norms of the day and begins to cast a new vision of what the kingdom of God is about and what it should look like here on earth uh, to help us prepare for that glorious day in heaven. And so as we think of the kingdom of God, as we think about us, the church, and what it looks like to be part of the kingdom, uh, we're going to step back into this time where the disciples are going to be challenged yet again by Jesus' teaching. And as we come off of last week's message, a challenging message about remarriage and divorce and adultery, uh, we're going to go into, I think, what will be very challenging for us together as we just look at our response to the gospel, ultimately. Um, so I wanted to start with a quote from a famous evangelist, Luis Palau. He says, he says this, the church is like manure. Pile it up and it stinks up in the neighborhood. Spread it out and it enriches the world. Yeah, the church, you and I, as we endeavor to share the gospel, I think Luis is right. We can do a poor job of it. We can have the wrong uh, motivations. We can become busy or distracted or off mission or just unfocused on who Jesus is and, and how he's impacted us. I love his heart. Uh, Luis died in Portland, Oregon, March 11th, 2021. Did a lot of evangelism throughout the world, was was a big part of the Billy Graham era as well. And as he thinks about the church, thinks about how we respond as the church, there's a story about Luis that I think uh, exemplifies the challenge we're going to look at today. See, Luis was doing a, a crusade in Bolivia years ago, and it's, it says that his day started with breakfast where he shared Christ with a number of top government officials. So he was allowed into rooms that many don't get to go. It says he was looking forward to a luncheon with the president of Bolivia. And at mid-morning, he was in the middle of a press conference in his hotel room when there's a knock on the door. A team member walked in with a small Bolivian girl, about 11, who had seen Palau on TV and was anxious to talk to him. Palau felt a bit irritated at the team member for bringing her into the room at a time like that. But he greeted the girl, picked up the book, or picked up a book, signed it, and gave it to her. It says, Lord bless you, sweetheart, as he began to lead her to the door. She took two steps, looked back, and said confidently, but Mr. Palau, I really wanted to receive Christ into my heart. <laughs> you imagine the crushing blow as Louis, Louis was caught up short. He dismissed the newsmen, sat down, led the little girl to Jesus, and later that day, he led the president of Bolivia to Christ. Both appointments were significant. See, the church stinks sometimes when we get so caught up in what we think we're called to do, and, and we don't really do what God is leading us to do. I think he's right. The church can stink. <laughs> But when we're spread out and doing the work of God with God, what a beautiful picture. It truly enriches the world. And, and we're looking at the disciples today, and I want to remind you just for a moment, you don't need to turn there, I just want to remind you of a, a little story that happened back in chapter 9 that leads us in a little bit into chapter 10. See, the, the disciples had just experienced, some of them experienced the transfiguration, the revealing of the glory of God in Jesus. And as they came back into town, there was arguments, there's a lot going on, but the disciples were arguing about who's the greatest. So they're looking at status and symbols and, and who's doing great things. And Jesus, of course, 
catches wind of it, challenges them. And then in verse 36 says, he takes a child and puts it in the midst of him and puts him in his arms and wraps his arms around this child. And he says to the disciples, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. There's this moment. The disciples are looking who's the greatest. Jesus is making a point that it's about those who you serve. And remember, the picture of children was that they were a nuisance in society. They didn't provide any value. They didn't invest in anything. And they were a distraction from the disciples' perspective. And Jesus speaks into that. He says, no, 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 no. This isn't about who's greatest. This is about those who we serve, and we serve everyone. Now, I want you to keep that bubble like a cartoon for a moment. Just imagine if you were the disciples and you just heard Jesus talk about the value of children, and and he grabs the child, uses the child as an example. And then we step into chapter 10, verse 13, and watch and see how the disciples respond, and then Jesus, how he interacts with the disciples and the other people in the story. So, Mark chapter 10, 13 says this, and they were bringing children to him that he might touch them and the disciples rebuked them. (laughs) So there's the bubble. Hey, children are important. This is really a valuable lesson. It's about serving everybody. And the children come in because there's parents, it appears, who are bringing their children to Jesus. And this was a custom of the day that that they would bring their children to the rabbi to bless them, to to pronounce a blessing of peace and prosperity on them. And this was the heart of the, the family members who were bringing the children. And one important, I think, key as you start to study Scripture, and I've really been impressed by this, just it's really transformed how I see Scripture, but also challenged my heart. Our English language, we're very... Um, vague oftentimes, our language. We have words that seem to cover a plethora of ideas, and in this case, children. And children shows up throughout Mark in many different ways, the the word for children. But this one happened to be in the Greek was paideon. And paideon really referenced the infant age of a child. So these were families bringing infants to Jesus. And they were offering it like we do, a dedication to the Lord. They want to dedicate their children like a sacrifice to say, this is, this is God's child, please bless my child. Very common for the day. And so the heart is right. They're coming to the right person ultimately, because it's not just a rabbi, this is Jesus, God in the flesh. And they're coming to him and look at the disciples' response. They rebuked them. Now, we could maybe lighten up a little on them. It could be that in their heart, they're thinking, this is just another distraction. There's a great teaching we just got through and we're, we're processing. This is a distraction. You're, you're, you're distracting Jesus. He's tired. Maybe they're wanting to protect Jesus because there's continually this crowds that always are forming. So maybe their motivations were right. Maybe they were good intentions, but, but it says they rebuked them, like, get out of here. And then Jesus in verse 14, when he saw it, he was indignant. This is a a word that's basically greatly displeased, (laughs) maybe disgusted and disappointed. I mean, bubble, remember back in chapter nine, disciples, remember I just said the value of children? Do you not remember? Are you losing sight of why I'm here? I came for all to seek and save the lost. That's, that's what I'm here for. So he says he was, it says he was indignant to them. And then here's what Jesus says. Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of God. See, Jesus said he came to proclaim that the kingdom of God is near. And it appears the disciples were keeping children and potentially their families from receiving the kingdom of God. That's, that's a big deal. That's something we need to be very cautious of. And Jesus continues in verse 15. He says, Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. Uh, 
Heather Jones, part of our teaching team, she uses the term that Jesus is wildly interruptible. Have you noticed on and on there's people who are coming with illnesses and demon possessions, and now we have children being offered up to be blessed, and Jesus gets very irritated, like, this is what I'm here for. Don't lose sight. Don't lose sight. He says, look, this is important. He's wildly interruptible. Jesus always has time for you and for me. He's never too busy. And we see that on display here. And so, you know, the question is, are you interruptible though? Are you interruptible when it comes to the things of God? Is there enough margin in your life? It reminds me of a story, kind of like Luis. I was working on a block wall. You know those big blocks you can buy at the hardware store and you stack them up Fill them, backfill them with dirt, and they look nice, and they, they keep the, the ground from perhaps moving forward on your property. So I had this big delivery of all these blocks. There was a couple hundred of them, and they were the big ones. They weren't like the little minis. And so I was sweating. I'm working, and you know my arms are getting cut up, and it's getting warm. I was doing it in the morning. It was summer. And I really don't like the heat. I don't like working in the sun. I love cloudy days. Uh, That is just me. I love rain and clouds. And so I'm working to try to get it done before the heat of the day. And wouldn't you know it, a car pulls up. And some people get out, and I know immediately who it is. This is the Jehovah Witness are coming, and they want to speak to me. And I'm I'm really irritated, to be honest, because I just want to work. My focus is there. My focus is not on the work of the kingdom. My focus is on the work of a wall. And I said, ah, this isn't a good time. Yeah, thanks so much for coming, maybe another day. And I dismissed them and I I got back to work and I remember it was like God said, hey, Craig, why don't you sit down for just a moment? (laughs) Remember how you're always talking about that you want to witness to those who have a different belief system, especially the Jehovah's Witness, because it's part of your family heritage. You have that in your family. Remember your heart. Remember the heart I gave you. Uh, I was crushed. Like I was crushed at this moment because I'm looking at a wall, a project. I'm looking at the sun. I'm feeling the heat increasing, not only externally, but internally. And so I was like, yeah, you're right, God. And so I watched as they went house to house above the neighborhood. There was kind of a road above me. And I I took off the gloves, kind of swept off the dust. And I, I kind of ran up to him and said, hey, if you have time, come on back. I'd love to visit with you. And so they came back and sure enough, we talked for a while and I heard what they wanted to share and I shared the gospel. And uh, I'd love to say that they all confessed Jesus and repented and came to faith. Um, In fact, they really didn't want me to pray over them, but that didn't stop me. I did as they walked away. But I was reminded of that moment as I read this because I thought so many times I'm not really interruptible. I'm really challenged by that idea. And Jesus was on display. In fact, the first point I wanted to draw out today is he just says, let them come to me. Don't hinder this. Look what he said. He says, let the children come to me. Let them come to me. Do not hinder them. For such belo- to such belongs the kingdom of God. Don't block what's happening. Your concern, perhaps, disciples, you're concerned about what's going on in the room right now or the teaching that might be happening or the circumstances of the size of the crowd, but you lost focus. You lost the heart of what we're doing here. Let them come to me, he would say. And so for you and I, the question you might have to ask is, are there people that you perhaps hinder from receiving the gospel, from hearing the truth of the gospel? Are there people at your workplace that you think they're not interested? Or I don't have time for that. Or I'm just too busy. Are are you stuck in that platform? And I want to speak to families for just a moment. I want to speak to those actively parenting and grandparenting. I think this is the, the challenge we face in the busyness of trying to raise kids. Uh, I'm I'm past that that age of kids, perhaps looking to grandparents down or as being a grandparent down the road in a few years, maybe. But nonetheless, in the parenting phase of life, I often thought about it takes quantity of time to have the quality conversations. There's, a, there's an innate need of time with our kids. And so the question that I want to ask you is, do you have time 
for conversations with your kids? Do you allow time for questions? Even if they're hard questions, do you allow conversation over the doubts that your kids or your grandkids may have? And do you allow for conversations about faith? Or do you say things like, when you're older, I'll, I'll be happy to share that with you? These are precious days, the days that we have with our kids. And for those of you who aren't in that phase yet, or even if you are, I want to just remind you that there are children's ministries and student ministries as well. These are integral opportunities for you to have a part in bringing the kingdom of God to kids. I remember uh, the daycare age of my kids and how grateful I was for a nursery worker who loved my child while God loved me with his word. Like what a blessing it was. I want to encourage you to think about where maybe you can serve, to love the kids in your community, in your neighborhoods, and and, in our church community. But I think as we move forward, I want us to kind of unpack a few ideas. Jesus, of course, says, don't hinder them. Don't stop. Let them come to me. This is important. This is why I'm here. And I want to point out the next part of the passage. You notice this is a short passage today, but it's rich with concepts and ideas that Jesus is drawing us to. And so here's the next point I want to draw out is that childlike faith is required. Childlike faith is required. Look at it in the text. Jesus says, truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. This goes against a lot of our ideas of what it means to understand the kingdom of God. He says, If you want the kingdom of God, you have to receive it like a child. And I want to differentiate between two terms that many of you are common with. There's childlike faith, and then there's childish faith. (laughs) Childlike versus childish. And for those that don't yet know the gospel, many of them would say your belief, your belief in Jesus is just childish. I mean, come on, look around you. The world's hard. You think it's that simple? And I'm here to proclaim the good news of Jesus as yes, it is that simple, but we are called to childlike faith, not childish faith. What's the difference? Well, childish faith is often self-centered. God, what can you do for me? How can you fix this? Childlike faith is God-centered. Childish faith is often demanding If you've ever raised a child or been around a child or seen a child in the store somewhere demanding something, you know what I'm talking about. Childish faith is demanding of God, but childlike faith is surrendered to God, to his plan. Childish faith says, God, you said you would shield me from any kind of harm or pain or suffering. Oh, that's not what God declared. Childlike faith is trusting that how God operates is more important. And what he allows is for his purposes and for his glory. Childish faith says, give me, give me, give me. Childlike faith is a heart of gratitude that says, look at what you've done. I want to unpack this a little further about what childlike faith looks like, because I really thought about three kind of key areas for us to think about when it comes to a child. The first one is that Jesus would say to you and me, childlike faith requires that you are completely helpless. You acknowledge you're completely helpless. Like like a child, a child would say, you have to carry me in the infant stage. Carry me here, carry me there. I can't walk yet. I can't move hardly. I can't talk and express my emotions. I can only cry. And I can't explain to you why I'm crying. I am helpless to you. Spiritually, for you and me, that says that I have nothing to offer. Like, like I bring nothing to the kingdom of God right now except me. This is it. I can't fix myself. I can't save myself. I can't do anything as a beneficiary to be to receive this. All I can do is say, here I am. I'm completely helpless. Childlike faith says I'm helpless before creator God. Secondly, childlike faith says I am totally helpless dependent on you, God. I am totally dependent on you. See, practically as a child, it says, feed me. I can't feed myself. I'm dependent on you. Change me. I'm a mess. (laughs) Uh, My diapers are dirty. 
clothe me because I'm cold. This is a, what the dependence of a child looks like. And for you and I, spiritually, it says, God, I want to receive your love. I am dependent on your love. I'm dependent on your salvation to be complete and full. I'm dependent that you did everything that I could never do. I'm dependent on your plan. I'm dependent on your purpose. I'm dependent on the fact that you declared that the work is finished. And I have a hope now because of you. I have complete dependence. Do you have that kind of faith? The last one I wanted to draw out, the childlike faith requires limited understanding. Now, for some of you, that, that seems contradictory. I want to explain. So for a child, the example of a child is a child lacks experience. They just don't have much life experience. They, they don't maybe even have evidence because they haven't studied enough things. They don't have enough knowledge. And Jesus says, none of that's required. Childlike faith in me is. I want to give you a, an example. There's a, a book called The Second Coming of the New Age by Stephen Bancares and Josh Peck. And in this book, they're really referencing lots of different religious ideas or cults or beliefs, all of them innately desiring what Jesus has to offer. This one's specific to New Age movements. Just listen to the list and think about it from limited understanding as opposed to what the understanding is expected to have a spiritual life. And the fact is that those who practice the new age and those who seek other cults and religions, they generally, they genuinely want a spiritual life. And Jesus says, that's what I have to offer, true spiritual life. But here's the list. Here's, if you want to be a, a, an effective new age person, here's what is some of what's required. This is from a man that came out of this and the gospel was revealed to him fully and he surrendered and no longer lives this way. But here it is. Um, I'm not going to try to explain every statement I'm going to make. I just want you to hear the list. First, it says, to have a spiritual life, you need to raise your vibrations. You need to practice mindfulness and balance and cleanse your chakras. Meditate and practice yoga to self-realize. Use crystals, psychedelics. Practice Reiki and other tools for spiritual development. Contemplate and study secret divine knowledge, such as sacred geometry and alchemy. Practice magic and divination. Try to astral project and lucid dream to explore uh, higher realms. Maintain positive dominant thoughts since you attract what you put in. Be loving to people to work off bad karma from, ba from past lives. Disidentify from the thought emotion, and ego, study Buddhism, Hinduism, Sikhism, Taoism, and other wisdom traditions. And after they've done all this, they have to do it all over again in a potentially infinite number of incarnations. This is a never-ending laundry list of things to do to achieve a state of enlightenment. A mountain of ascension with no visible peak is what everyone in the New Age movement is spending time, money, effort, blood, sweat and tears trying to climb. That doesn't sound like childlike faith. <laughs> that sounds like a lot of work. A mountain of ascension with no visible peak. I don't bring this up to poke fun at it. I believe that the genuine heart of someone in the New Age movement is desiring only what Jesus can provide. And he says, you have to come to me totally dependent on me. Totally dependent to understand, spiritually speaking, that Jesus came and he lived and he died and he rose again, defeating death and sin and giving us the opportunity for true spiritual life. Jesus said he's the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through him. There is no invisible mountain. He was very visible. And what he accomplished was forever. And finally, that Jesus is all that I need. That's all I have to declare. Lord, you're who I need. That you are Lord. And all I'm required is to repent and believe, as Jesus said in chapter 1. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe. One other perspective I wanted to bring up is this. 
you look at this passage again, it says, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. I saw some other commentators on it, and it really made sense to me when I thought of it from the story of actual receiving of children. I mean, how would you receive if today I walked up with a child and handed it to you? How would you receive that? Most of you wouldn't, you know, tuck it under your arm like a football. You wouldn't say, oh, thanks, and just toss it back. You would hold this delicately, and it reminds me of of my boys. And I got two boys. They're no longer stuck in the bath like this. Praise God for that. But I have two boys, and and through the process of their being uh, birthed into the world, my wife, Jennifer, she had to have cesarean uh, surgeries for both of them and deliveries that way. And I had the, the incredible blessing, though. As hard as it was to leave my wife on the operating table, I ushered both boys and was able to wash them for the first time. And it's such a, an incredible moment. And as I think about the value of this, do I receive the gospel like this, as a precious gift given to us? Not to be just tossed around, not to be just flung in the corner, but to be held and adored. Do I receive the gospel like that as truly good, life-saving news? Or do I receive it with skepticism and maybe even talking bad about the gospel? Perhaps speaking ill of those who would even believe such a simple story, such an incredible, complex God who gave us a simple plan and a simple path. As I held my children, I realized a couple things about them. One, I never knew I could love someone like this. That idea that at that moment holding my son, I would die for him. Like I would, I would do whatever it took so that he could have life. And isn't that the heart of our father? I mean, as a sinful father, a human, how much more love does the father in heaven have, the perfect father, that he would die for us? You see, childlike faith is our continual requirement. Unlike a child that grows up, I wanted my kids to grow out of the bathtub phase. I wanted them to have a successful life. But when it comes to the spiritual life with Christ, the fact is childlike faith is our continual requirement. And it leads us to become even more increasingly dependent on Christ. So in the spiritual mind, this is me being held by my Savior. And the more I depend on him, ironically, the more life I receive the more joy I'm filled with, the more love I experience, the more peace that enters me and dwells in me and surrounds me. That's the beauty of the gospel. I wanted to close with a quote today from Johnny Erickson Tata. Now, for those who don't know Johnny, she, she was 17 years old, very active young woman. And she was swimming one day and dove and just misjudged the depth of the water And hitting her head, she ended up coming up paralyzed. This is over 50 years ago. She has an incredible ministry of ministering to those who are disabled and those who have experienced trauma in their body, who experience great physical pain. And she said this, that she, God, excuse me, God chose the thing that she despised, her broken body. God chose the things that she despised for his glory. She says it about faith this way. Faith isn't the ability to believe long and far into the misty future. It's simply taking God at his word and taking the next step. You see, faith isn't about, childlike faith isn't about all the knowledge. It's not about being able to memorize God's word. It's not about being able to to understand the depths of his creation. It's a childlike faith that just says, I don't know what the future looks like, but I trust you today for today's step. Faith isn't the ability to believe long and far into the misty future. It's simply taking God at his word and taking the next step. As Jesus says, the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe. I love you guys. I hope that you're challenged by your faith today. I hope you see the gospel as a beautiful, attainable gift for everybody. It doesn't matter how old or young you are. It doesn't matter how rich or poor, how smart or 
unintelligent you are, God says, I'm here for all of you. And all you need is childlike faith. Love you guys. I'm going to release to the campus pastors and look forward to seeing you here in the future. Yeah, as you close today, as we kind of close our time, I just wanted to bring us back to Mark 1.15. I know I've used this many times this week because I think this is the essence and the moment that you and I can really wrestle with. Jesus says, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And if you're watching this and you've never repented and believed in the gospel, it's a very simple but a very profound moment where you say, God, you are holy and you are perfect. And everything that you do is out of love for me, even when you came as Jesus and died and rose again. And I repent. That's, that's where I turn away from the sin that I'm involved in. I acknowledge that my sin is against you and only you. And others may be hurt by it, but this is against you, God. That's what repenting is. And then believe like a child that Jesus will indeed not only begin to cleanse you, but he will declare you a child of God. He will give you the spirit of God as a, a guarantee for the future in heaven with him. He says you are now have an inheritance in heaven and that spirit will hold that to you and hold it with you. And if you're reading this and you're listening, you're like, yeah, I've already believed in the gospel. I want to remind you of something. This is a daily exercise. So you never outgrow the gospel. If you're watching this, it's nine o'clock in the morning. When you woke up this morning, you needed to remember this. You needed to remember the gospel is for today and your childlike faith, it should be increasing in dependency, not decreasing. I love you guys. I just want to pray with you before you go. Would you pray? Father God, thank you for your word today. Thank you for loving us and for your great passion for us to make the gospel not only beautiful, but attainable, that we can receive with simple faith. We don't have to be brilliant scholars. We don't have to be rich and wealthy. We don't have to be anything more than willing. And so God, I pray for everyone listening today. If they have not received, that they would receive. And if they've already received the good news of Christ, and today you are Lord and Savior, that they would remember dependence on you is a daily exercise. We never outgrow that. We love you and we give you all praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. See you guys later.